Well, many of you in the room are extroverts, which likely means you enjoy going to parties, dinner parties and gatherings and celebrations and wedding parties, et cetera. And for the introverts in the room, you just get drugged to these things even though you don't want to go most of the times. So so let's just say for a minute that you were at a a big dinner party um, with a lot of people and you had to go to this dinner party. So you're there, and maybe you're the introvert who doesn't really want to be there, but you mingle a little bit, but you're more of an observer. You like to watch people, and you observe this dinner party, and what you observe at this party is the smoozing. You know, the, the guests that smooze the host are trying to get in good with the host. You observe this. Maybe you talk about it on the way home, just saying. And maybe you also observe that the host has invited certain people, fellas, maybe you recognize this, invited certain people to do business with, and so there's a, an element of, of uh, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours to this dinner party. But there's something else that happens that often doesn't happen. Someone in the dinner party calls it out. They just stand up and begin to talk about all the things that they're observing in their dinner party to which Maybe if you're that person, you ever been in that awkward dinner party where somebody says something they shouldn't, the social etiquette of it, and the spouse is like under the table, like hitting you or pushing you? My wife does that sometimes when I'm talking too much. She wants to do that right now. The awkward moments that you face at the party where somebody says something they're not supposed to say and the etiquette is bad and you're like, hey, reel that in, man. I don't want to be a part of something like that, but it gives me something to talk about on the way home. We come to a passage this morning and where Jesus is invited to a dinner party. And maybe you've had the hypothetical question asked before, hey, who in human history would you invite to a party? Maybe to dinner. And maybe your answer, if it was Jesus, maybe it won't be Jesus after this parable that he tells. At the dinner party. He's invited to this dinner party of the Pharisees. The ruler of the Pharisees invites him to a party where there's a lot of people. And in that day, they usually had these tables that kind of went in a U-shaped around. There were a lot of people there. And you know the Pharisees, what are they trying to do? They're trying to entrap Jesus. And so there's this guy there who is sick. And the text says that he has this condition called dropsy, which just means that he likely has a type of cancer that we know it of, and he's bloated. Like You can see that there's a problem there, and what are they trying to do? at this dinner party that they graciously invited Jesus to. They're trying to entrap him to see if he will heal someone. And guess what? When is the party? The party is on the Sabbath, of course. I mean, the Pharisees can prepare a party on the Sabbath, but Jesus can't heal anybody, right? So he shows up, and Jesus, knowing what they're going to say, or they're watching him, and he turns to the Pharisees, and he says, if you had a son or an ox who fell into a pit, would you not get them out on the Sabbath? See, the Pharisees know that the law, there's provision for something like that in the law. And guess what? Again and again and again, they say nothing. They can't respond, but they keep doing this deal. So Jesus, the context of the parables that he's going to tell today, he's at a dinner party. He's at a dinner party. And he's going to do a number of things. He doesn't stop at that point in the dinner party where it's already awkward. He keeps going. He uses it for a context to speak about other things he's already observed at the dinner party. He comes after the guests. (laughs) And then he does the unthinkable. He comes after the host. And what he's doing today in the parables, we've been in a series on parables if you haven't been with us, and we're coming to the end next week. But he's in these parables, and parables are really real-to-life stories that Jesus tells to pack a a spiritual truth, a spiritual punchy truth usually, to teach the things that he wants to teach to his audience. Today, here's what he's doing. He's saying in God's kingdom, relationships don't work this way. They don't work in a way where I'm trying to be a guest that's climbing the social ladder. I'm hosting a party where I'm just trying to get in good with certain people so I can do business with them. He's calling that out because in Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom that we live and exist in, particularly as a church, it doesn't work that way. And so Jesus is going to talk really about a kingdom relationships, not only kingdom relationships with one another, but also how do we relate to the king of the kingdom? Turn with me to Luke 
chapter 14, and we'll be in verses 7 through 24, page 873 in the Bible next to you if you need it. And so maybe an operative question as you think about this, man, what do our relationships look like with one another, particularly in the church? Do we go to parties to raise our social awareness, our social status? Do we invite others to our parties for our own purposes because it's just transactional to us? Is that the way God wants us to be in the kingdom of God, in the church? Or do we do that to bless and care for people? So Luke chapter 14, 7 through 24, we pick it up in verse 7. The dinner party is already awkward. I've already told you the background, and so he says this. Jesus says this, verse 7. Now he told a parable to this dinner party that I described, to those who were invited, the guests, when he noticed how they chose the place of honor. So they show up and choose a place of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, so the parable is about a wedding, Do you not sit in the place? Don't sit in the place of honor. Let someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit at the lowest place, so that when the host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The first point that Jesus is getting at to this dinner party, and really to his own disciples, is in God's kingdom. We don't elevate ourselves to climb the social ladder. We don't need to, because God gives us position. God gives us status. God gives us our own identity as the people of God. We don't need to climb any church social ladder. We don't need to elevate ourselves. He exalts us. And if you notice in this parable, these people, these guests arrive, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to jockey for position. It's like when you go to the Astros game and you have a certain seat and you go ahead and move up before, like this fifth inning before you can move up, right? They're jockeying for position. Think about a wedding. Think about how that works at a wedding. So they, they want status They want to be in this inner circle. They're using somebody's generosity for their own purposes and their own means. And what does Jesus say? It's just common sense, right? Jesus is given some common sense, like proverbial wisdom here to help them not look shameful. Take the lesser seat and let them, let others exalt you. He's speaking into the idea of humility, isn't he? It's proverbial. If you actually go to the book of Proverbs in chapter 25, Solomon says this, don't put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it's better to be told, come up here, than you put lower in the presence of a noble. So we don't elevate ourselves in the kingdom of God. We don't need to. We don't, there's no need for climbing some church social ladder. The, the parable is a wedding. If you Google Top things not to do at a wedding, like bad etiquette, you can find all kinds of things, can't you? Ladies, you know. I mean, what if a a, a woman who's not in the wedding, who's not the bride, and is not in the wedding party, shows up in a white dress? What you thinking? And it's a really nice white dress. It's not a beach wedding, so you didn't get the invite and say, everybody wear white. What do you think? You're out of line. Why are you bringing attention to yourself? And at weddings, everybody's got a story, right? You got a story from your own wedding. And people bringing attention to themselves. Maybe it's a bridesmaid. Maybe it's a groomsman. Maybe it's a mother of the bride. Maybe it's a father of the bride. Maybe it's somebody there that had too much. Bringing attention to themselves. I got a story. Can't say names because it's recorded. (sighs) Rehearsal dinner. Our rehearsal dinner. It went on. My family goes on about things. And it had been, I don't know, an hour and a half. And it's probably started like 7.30. It's 9.30-ish. And some, I'll just say this, somebody in my family, not hers, somebody in my family comes up to me with this look like, hey, and no lie, like we're Baptists, so we didn't have any alcohol at all. So people don't have an excuse for what they're saying. Like they should be fine. (laughs) And a guy in my family says, When is this going to be over, Seth? 
I got plans. I'm going dancing. And you know in those moments, it's like, I just finished seminary. I'm supposed to be godly. And all I could do, y'all, all I could do is chuckle and walk away. I could just chuckle. If I had it to do over again, well, I don't know if I want to do it over again. But what I would probably say, amongst other things that I shouldn't say, in that moment, is like, hey, you know what? Tomorrow when you show up to my wedding, you're not sitting in the front. You're sitting in the back. You're in timeout. All right? What I wanted to say that I didn't say was, this isn't about you. Can you just let it be? That's what Jesus is getting at. Don't do that. Don't be a bad guest. Don't make it about yourself. Don't make yourself the center of attention. When somebody else is in focus, have some humility. Isn't that what Paul says in the book of Philippians, that generally about our lives, don't just look out for your own interests. Look out for the interest of others. Think about others more important than yourself. And if you need an example, Philippians, look at Jesus. He humbled himself. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross for you and for me. Look at Jesus if you need the example of humility. Live humble lives. Don't exalt yourself to climb some social ladder. And I'll just ask you, and these are just diagnostics for you. I've been asking myself these things this week. Do you have to be the center of attention? Do you even know you need to be the center of attention? Maybe, do you need to be the center of attention to move up some imaginary social church status pole that you think is driven by your performance, and it's not? Man, if you think about life in a church, and are you, are you, are you there, for example, in, in your community group? We make a big deal about community groups here. We want you to be in the life of other people. I can promise you, if you're Likely, if you're frustrated with your community group, there may be a diagnostic question you need to ask. Man, am I going here and being a participant here to get something or to give something? Because God's kingdom is different, isn't it? Like when we just go to get, what happens is if we're not giving and we just want, we don't have. But in God's kingdom, when we give ourselves away and we care for the needs of others and we make about it, we get, we receive from the Lord and from others. This is the way God's kingdom works. And so Jesus is just saying, man, kingdom living to this dinner party, kingdom living shouldn't look like this. It shouldn't look like this. You don't need this. It kind of, you're kind of chasing your tail effectively anyway when you do that. I give you identity. I give you status. I give you position. It's mine to give. But look, he doesn't stop there. He digs into these heart motives of these guests at a dinner party, bad etiquette. But then he turns on the host, and you know the disciples are like probably punching him under the table. Just chill, man. But he doesn't. He keeps going. Look at it in verse 12. Look at verse 12 through 14. He, he comes into the heart motives of the host, the Pharisees. He says, also to the man who had invited him, who was that? If you look at 14, 1 and 2, it's the ruler of the Pharisees. Not just any Pharisees, the ruler of the Pharisees. When you give a dinner or a banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors only, I think. It's hyperbole. Lest they also invite you in return and you be, what's the next word? Repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. What's the implication? Do they have a home? They don't. They have nothing to give you, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. That's eternal blessing. Here's what I don't think Jesus is saying. Never invite your friends over, right? I don't think that's what Jesus is saying, but he's getting at the heart motive of being inviting these kinds of people because they can repay, and that's the way the first century worked. It was like the patronage system. So here's what Jesus is saying. In God's kingdom also, relationships are not simply a means to an end for us. They are not quid pro quo. They're not a favor for a favor. I invite you over, you invite me over, we do business, and so you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's not how relationships with one another in the church and the kingdom of God ought to work. That's what he's saying to this dinner party. He's observing the motives of the host here, kind of platforming 
scheming, and who is invited becomes the most important thing because they're going to invite them back. I, I just hear uh, um, British drama um, master, what is it, master class theater, that music, Downton Abbey. Like, it's kind of that, the aristocracy. It's thick, isn't it? You watch it and you're like, man, they did a lot of dinner parties and things to make things happen for themselves. That's what we're talking about here. That's what Jesus is observing in this place. And what's interesting in Israel is that this was common among people, but when you think about the history of Israel, you think about the stranger coming to the home and what is the culture, what's the kind of cultural mandate? It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they're poor or rich or anything. You take care of them. So it really didn't even fit with the way Israel treated the stranger and the sojourner or people they didn't even know. They gave hospitality and generosity because God had been generous to them. And so he's calling this out. He observes this. It's kind of this litmus test that Jesus gives them. And just saying, are the only people in your life that you hang out with people that can repay you and give you something for something? That's what he's calling out. I'm surprised they didn't ask him to leave at that point. But he's still there. Generosity. That's what we see in the New Testament, isn't it? Because God, through Christ, has been generous to us, that we're generous, it overflows in our generosity to others. That we, we saw with, you think about Matthew, when he came to know Jesus, Levi, the tax collector. You know, one of the first things he does when he believes in Jesus, what does he do? He invites his friends over to his house, and he invites Jesus, and he throws a party out of the generosity of of Jesus to him spiritually. It overflows into his generosity from Jesus. Jesus has already given him salvation. He's not giving him anything. He's generous, and he wants his friends to know the generosity of Jesus. We see that in the New Testament when you come to the book of Acts and you see the early church and the church beginning. And it almost makes us uncomfortable as Americans who are individuals. I mean, they are sharing with one another. They are praising God. They're opening the Word of God, and sharing it. And they're sharing their possessions and their land. Sometimes we lay over that government, and it's nothing to do with the government taking land. These are people in the community of faith saying, I will give to you because you have need. There is extravagant generosity from Christian to Christian, not because they can be repaid, but it's the love that Christ has shown them that they're showing one another. And that's a beautiful thing in the life of the church. It's something that I watch in this church all the time, the generosity of one another. I don't see that in our church, praise God. I don't see hosts doing this. I don't see people coming to parties doing this. And that's a beautiful example of what it looks like to be the body of Christ, and I commend you. But we have to be careful in personal relationships, right, in the family of God, that it doesn't translate. Because many of us work in the business world, and that's just kind of the way it works, right? Like, if, you have to, if you're a salesman and you have to entertain people, like, there is a favor for a fa- That's the way it works. In many of your jobs that you're entertaining, you're trying to get somebody's business, and that's fine. Many of your jobs involve those kinds of things. But, man, if you bring that home to your spouse, how's that going to work for you? How's that working for you? And say, well, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. That doesn't work in marriage, It blows marriages up. That doesn't work with your kids. That doesn't work with your friends. And it surely doesn't work in the family of God. I've watched it blow up churches. I've watched it blow up church leaderships. I've watched it blow up relationships. Because it's not rooted in the generosity of God. It's rooted in what I want. So those are diagnostics for us, man. Do we invite folks into our world who we stand to gain little from? How are we doing with that as a church? How are you doing that with relationships close to you? And I'd also say this. As a church, we desire to live on mission, both individually and as a church, to reach into the needs of people in places that we can't reach to support ministries. But I can promise you this. I've watched it for 20 years. When churches, when the operative question of a church as it relates to mission is, 
How does it benefit us? People don't do mission. They might throw some money at people, but they don't do mission. They don't care for the needs of others who can't repay them. May it never be of our church. It's not, praise God. But may it never be of our church that we're just out for our own benefit. We want to be people on mission to meet the spiritual needs of people who don't know Jesus, not because we need something in return or a pat on the back, but because we love Jesus and we want people to know him. So Jesus makes this dinner party awkward. And in verse 15, look at it. In verse 15, there's a dude that stands up and he's trying to change the subject. He's the peacemaker. What he says would be the equivalent of us in the middle of that awkward situation saying, how's the weather, everybody? Verse 15, he changes the subject. Guy stands up, awkward moment, changes the subject. When one of those who's reclined at the table with him heard these things, verse 15, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. What he's saying is, I know we're arguing here and this is a tension point, but guess what? We're all going to be in heaven one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb, so everything's cool. Kumbaya, man. That's what he's doing here. Little does he know that Jesus is going to use his statement and keep going. It's as if Jesus is saying, I'm glad you said that. Listen to this. See, first century Jews thought that if they were Jews, that one day in heaven, when they die, one day in heaven, all Jews, it would just be Jews, all Jews would be in heaven celebrating at the wedding supper of the Lamb, the great banquet. This is a dinner party, the great banquet at the end of time when we're all together. It's all Jews. And Jesus said, well, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me tell you about that. And he tells another parable at this dinner party. Awkward. And he says this. But he said to him, so he turns to the guy who's trying to make peace. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for this banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out to see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yokes of oxen, and I may examine them. Please have me excuse me, and I'm not coming. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I can't come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. And the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in who? The poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done. I love this phrase. Look at it. And still there is room. There's room for the great banquet. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges far out, away from Israel, and compel, meaning persuade people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. What is Jesus saying? Let me give you the big picture. Jesus is saying that the invited guests are Israel. And Israel, for the most part, is going to reject the invitation that is theirs. And they're going to make all kinds of excuses because other things are too valuable to them. And this is God's plan all along, just so you know. It's always got been God's plan. He says, well, take the people in Israel that are crippled and lame and let them come in. And then go where? Go to the highways and the hedges, meaning go far away. The implication is this is the non-Jews, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and invite them to the feast. Invite them to this great banquet so that my house will be filled. You see, the desire of the Father to bring people in to his house and his kingdom. Here is your point. Hear this. In God's kingdom, God's generosity, it's his generosity that fills his house with undeserving guests. Undeserving guests. You know how invitations worked back then? You, like a wedding, like we do now, you would send an invitation like three months in advance, and people would RSVP. 
and say that they would come. Remember the culture of Israel and hospitality. If you said you were coming, it's not like today, hey, I had something come up, you, had, you needed to be there. Like it was incredibly rude, like you didn't talk to people after that. Incredibly rude to do that, to break relationship, hospitality. People didn't do that. Jesus knows that. So well out, the invitation goes out, and then the day of. They didn't have cell phones, right? So the day of, it's like the reminder email, but it's a reminder. The servants go out and remind the people, are you coming? And, and the answer should always be yes. Of course I am. RSVP, that's just the way it is. You come. And what happened with Israel? They made excuses. Do you see all the excuses in here? And by the way, they're lame excuses in first century. Livestock, livestock are going to be okay. You come to the party. Incredibly rude. I got land. Guess what? The land's still going to be there. I got married. Bring them. Kids, we do that. Come. You're, you're supposed to be here. So the master is angry, and then he goes out and invites other people because he will fill his house. It's not that he didn't know, just to be clear. But he wants to fill his house. This is Israel's rejection of the Messiah. The Messiah, Jesus, right here is invitation to the least of these, the ones who didn't get the dinner invite to this dinner party, by the way. This points, what Jesus is pointing to, is at the end of time, when you get to Revelation chapter 19, what do you see? You see the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's like the rehearsal dinner. I want you to see it. Revelation 19. 2024, we're going to get to Revelation. I'm getting excited about it already. We're going to preach through it. Revelation 19. God's Word says this in verse 6. 19, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. These are the saints. These are believers who know Jesus. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. Sorry, when in, in heaven, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be singing the glory of Christ. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. That's the church. That's God's people. It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited, catch it, who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what Jesus is pointing to. But it's kind of like the rehearsal dinner because you get to chapter 21 and you see the new heavens and the new earth. And so this is the wedding. If there's a rehearsal dinner. This is the wedding. 21, 1 through 6. Look at it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Check this out. Prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. This is God. This is the church and God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Not only is there a marriage, this is our home as believers. This is our home. This is where we will be. And he will dwell amongst them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning and crying or pain. Think about life. For the former things have passed away. You see, in God's kingdom, he generously fills his house with undeserving guests like you and like me. He even fills it with formerly religious people that had it all figured out, that were jockeying for position. And he also gives it to the people that know their need. He gives it to all. The invitation is to all. When we think about home, because that's effectively what we're saying, we're saying that our eternal home is heaven, and Jesus is extending invitation to all, to this eternal home, and yet people reject him. They turn the invitation down. No thanks. 
I want you to think about your home. Like home is where the heart is. That was what we say. We say all kinds of things about our home. We, we need to make a house our home. A home isn't just a place where we lay our head. When we come back from a vacation or being away, we can't wait to be home. We can't l- wait to sleep in our own bed. This is home. It's not simply a utilitarian place, is it? I hope it's not, where we sleep. It's meant to be a place of rest. It's meant to be a place of rejuvenation, recharge, res- restoration. It's meant to be a shelter from the storm. It's meant to be a place of peace and of refuge. It's not always that, is it? I mean, we post on social media all the beautiful things. It's not always that, this side of heaven. It's not always peaceful. It's not always without conflict, without trouble, but we long for that, don't we? That's what we want. That's what heaven is for us. This is the invitation of Jesus to all. We long for home, a place of eternal peace and comfort and warmth and nourishment. There's a a beautiful truth about that as it relates to the believer and our eternal home. Catch this. One day, the generous heavenly host takes you and me, the undeserving guest, and fills his heavenly house and feeds his guests with that which will satisfy. These are guests that are no longer jockeying for position and power or anything. Enjoy his presence. Why can we do that? Why is that the hope and the secure hope for the believer? Let me tell you why. Because the lamb was slain. The lamb was slain and he took our sins upon himself and sacrificed for you and for me the final sacrifice for sin. Do you know the lamb of God who takes away your sins that you might have a heavenly home one day and dwell with him and be with him? One of the notes of the text that you got to catch, and I just want to share this in the end here. The note of the text is this. It's Jesus Jesus is the one in the parable inviting guest to his own banquet. So here's the question, and it's your takeaway. What have you done with the invitation of Jesus? What have you done with that invitation? He invites you. He bids you to come. Is there no response? I'm doing my own thing. Or is it just a flat-out no? I've got better things to do. I've got more valuable things in my life to to engage in and participate in, or maybe it's maybe, which is still an answer. Or maybe it's yes. I hope it's yes. If we were Southern Baptists, we'd do an invitation right now and sing just as I am. We're not. But he invites you. He invites you to come, to know him, to be forgiven and to have a secure home in heaven someday when you die, that you will be with him, and all the pettiness of the things that we try to pursue here will fade away. Let me pray.